All right. Uh, so first of all, uh, thank you so much for coming here. I know this session only opened up on Monday, so we are truly grateful that you showed up. And we'll, we promise to try our best to, uh, to, so that you get value out of this session. Uh, so we are here to talk about the newly launched IAM Access Analyzer. And if you don't recognize the heading, then you're probably in the wrong room. Uh, but yeah, so hi. Uh, my name is Ujwal Pugalia. I'm the product manager uh, for IAM Access Analyzer. Uh, I have with me on stage Andrew Gasek, uh, who's a senior applied scientist on our team. And then we also have Mark and Aaron from Millennium Management. Um, they're actually one of our private beta customers, and they've graciously uh, agreed to, to show what they've done with our beta and what they plan to do in the future. So in terms of what we'll be covering today, uh, we'll start off, or I'll start off by giving you uh, a very high-level overview of IAM Access Analyzer. Um, if you've attended any other sessions that have had mentions of IAM Access Analyzer, you would know that uh, we present our information through findings. And, and I'm going to talk more about where you would see those findings, either directly or indirectly. Um, and then Andrew is going to do a, a demo and, and take you through the IAM console, which is where uh, our, our consolidated view is. Uh, and he's also going to go, uh, he's, he's one of the long timers in, in the automated reasoning group, so he's going to take you through uh, the journey of how we got here and also explain some of the sauce that goes into the making of IAM Access Analyzer. Uh, and this is an advanced session, so we actually have Mark and Aaron from one of our private beta, cust uh, as one of our private beta customers. And they are actually going to talk to you about uh, how they've actually implemented, taken IAM Access Analyzer as it is in the beta and, and implemented it into some of their own systems and what they plan to do now that it's launched. All right, so before I start talking about IAM Access Analyzer, I have to talk about our group, which is the Automated Reasoning Group. Uh, and essentially, uh, automated reasoning is, you can think of it as a cognitive science. I, I at least think of it as an art because I don't understand it completely. Uh, but uh, what it does is, is it uses uh, mathematical proofs and verification techniques uh, to prove properties of a system. Um, and essentially, uh, what AWS has done is they, um, uh, they like, basically hired a bunch of uh, the smartest minds in the, in the business, and they hired me. Uh, separately, uh, <laughs> and what they said, what they told us was, "Hey, you have this this technology. What you what we want you to do is do something which we they or or we've basically called as an initiative as provable security, uh, which essentially means not just security, but you're provably secure, and you can get more details about that initiative on the on the link there at the bottom, uh, but um, how we essentially started was by starting." like internally and proving properties of crypto protocols that AWS uses in code. Um, and when we started talking to external customers, uh, such as some of you in the crowd, uh, Mark and Aaron, uh, we realized uh, that there is, actually a, uh, what, uh, we, there is actually an experience or a use case that we can fulfill for our customers as well. Uh, and that was around the area of access controls and resource sharing. Um, so these are some of the resource, resources that I could uh, well align on one slide deck, but I know there's more. Uh, but these are some of the examples of resources that you can share uh, across accounts using resource policies. Uh, and what we've seen more and more customers as they grow uh, in, in AWS uh, is they've started using accounts as isolation techniques or mechanisms for resources. Uh, so you have a bunch of resources and you create account boundaries uh, on top of them. But then customers have valid business use cases for sharing these resources across accounts. Uh, so then they start using resource policies as enablers for this access. Uh, and there might be variety of examples like uh, giving access to all your resources to an audit account, let's say. Uh, and what happens is because as you keep growing and as you keep scaling, there might be uh, some misconfigurations that you might, mistaken, by, might make mistakenly. And, uh, for example, you might provide like, access to a KMS key to some other account that exists uh, in your organization, or even to a vendor, let's say, or, or some random account uh, due to some misconfiguration. Uh, and that's, that's bad, right? So in order to get visibility into all of this sharing, uh, 
essentially, we, on Monday, which is 12.2 on the first day of reInvent, we announced an IAM functionality called Access Analyzer. And what it helps you do is identify resources or supported resources uh, uh, with public or cross-account access uh, resources that exist in your account. Um, and actually gives you a very definitive answer or a very comprehensive answer on uh, all the access paths that the resource policies associated to these resources uh, allow access from outside of, that, of the account. Um, and we provide you this information in the form of findings and the workflow for, for a customer to use this is essentially they can look at a finding and say, okay, this looks like a valid business use case. The, the sharing is intended. I'm going to archive it. Um, or it could be, hey, yeah, this is a misconfiguration. This is not what I intended. I'm going to go to the resource policy and, and fix it. And, and the good thing about Access Analyzer is it actually continuously monitors the state of your policy and, and looks at it for changes. So as soon as you actually fix a policy, within 30 minutes or so, it's going to detect the change, reanalyze your policy, and mark it as a result if you actually have removed that access. Uh, all right, uh, so some of the benefits of Access Analyzer, uh, it's pretty quick. Uh, it analyzes thousands of resource policies, uh, depending on how, many, how much ever you have in your account. Uh, it is continuously monitoring, and I mentioned that it keeps looking for changes to these resource policies uh, for supported resources. Uh, and uh, it's comprehensive because it uses automated reasoning, which I talked about a little uh, earlier. And if all of this sounds uh, kludgy to you or you don't get it, uh, then it's actually free, so you should try it anyway. All right, so as I mentioned, we provide you this information in the form of findings. Um, and a logical question would be like, where do I see my findings? Where do I get it? Uh, so before I get into that, I wanted to talk about sort of how do you get started? And it's actually pretty easy. So you've done most of the part. You have an account. You have a bunch of resources. So these are the five resources that we actually share uh, or support today. Uh, but we will continue to add more and more resources. Uh, if you have feedback on what more resources you want us to uh, support moving forward, please let us know. Uh, so IAM roles, S3 buckets, Lambda functions, uh, KMS keys, and SQS queues, all of these support sharing through resource policies. So you already have this setup, I imagine. The, the only thing you actually need to do to get started is create what we call an analyzer. Um, and as soon as you create an analyzer at the account level, it automatically starts generating findings. Uh, and then administrators, security teams, or even others uh, can just look at those findings and, and the workflow, as I mentioned, is you either say, these findings look OK, or these findings don't look OK, and act accordingly. So some of the things that we've heard as feedback uh, is, hey, great, I can do this at an account level, but I have thousands of accounts. What do I do? Right, so we actually have pre-announced uh, an integration with AWS organizations. So if you are using AWS organizations, uh, essentially what you would need to do is, today you can only create an analyzer at an account level, but you do the same thing. You create an analyzer at an organization level, and it automatically looks at all the resources in any account that is a part of your organization that is shared outside your organization and gives you those findings. So um, you can find out if you have uh, mistakenly given access to anyone outside of your organization to a specific resource, uh, you will see that as a finding. All right, so I talked about the IAM console as being one way to get findings. Uh, but where else can you see those findings? We actually have launched uh, the CLI and public APIs through the AWS SDK. Um, so we, all the things that you can do in the console, you can essentially build your own using our APIs uh, or just use the APIs. We also provide any updates to findings through CloudWatch events or event bridge. Uh, so you don't even need to like call our APIs to list findings. You can just keep track of it using, uh, using CloudWatch events. Uh, so for, the, so for some of the folks in there saying, yeah, this is not enough, I need more, uh, we actually have more. Uh, we have directly integrated uh, into the S3 console specifically for buckets. As I mentioned, S3 buckets is one of the resources that we support at launch. Uh, and we have a view in the S3 console that actually characterizes or classifies buckets that are public and buckets with cross-account access and tells you that 
uh, in the S3 console itself. So you can actually do remediation steps in the same console and you don't need to actually go to the IM console if you're looking at S3 buckets. And if that's not enough, we have actually integrated with Security Hub. So if you are already using Security Hub, you will start seeing Access Analyzer findings. Uh, the only difference here is that we've tweaked it a little to reduce, like, Access Analyzer can give you 10 findings if a bucket is shared with 10 different, resource, uh, 10 different accounts. Uh, but in Security Hub, we will give you one finding for each resource just so that like, the number of findings are more aggregated. Uh, but you can always go, it's linked to Access Analyzer, so you can always go to Access Analyzer and find out uh, the 10 different findings that are associated to that one finding. Um, and if that's still not enough, we, uh, I know Jim and Sarah in their leadership session uh, on Monday, how many of you guys attended that show of hands? A few, but like, essentially they talked about like, the identity and security community and how we need to come together to help customers. And we are proud to announce that we are actually integrated with 11 different partners. Uh, so 10 technical integrations and Deloitte, who is our consulting partner. Uh, we have actually integrated with these folks. So they use IAM Access Analyzer findings uh, in their existing products to give you uh, more answers or, or, or more comprehensive answers through their solutions. All right, so uh, that's, that's all about Access Analyzer on a high level, uh, but Andrew's gonna give you a demo of how that looks in the IAM and the S3 console. All right, thank you, Ujwal. Let me boot up my laptop again. All right, so first, to find IAM Access Analyzer, you go to the IAM console. And on the left-hand side, under Access Reports, we have Access Analyzer. So I'm going to go in in my account, and I'm going to create a new analyzer. So this is the onboarding workflow. It's one click to create an analyzer. You can add tags if you want, but we're going to go right into it. And when I click Create, what it's going to do is it's going to assume a role in my account and start scanning my resource policies, looking for uh, what's being shared and who it's being shared with. And uh, now that it's done, I have these findings. And each of these findings is a broad category of access that's allowed to one of my resources. So for example, let's look at my S3 buckets. Here you can see I have various S3 buckets named after my favorite uh, Minnesota State Fair foods. And let's look specifically at the cheese curds bucket. So there's three findings for this bucket. And I can see two of these I recognize. So this source IP, I might say that's my on-prem data center. And I want them to have read and write access to the bucket. And this account number, that's my security audit role. And I want them to be able to list the contents. So for those two findings, I can mark them as intended by archiving them. But this last finding shows that this VPC has write permissions and tagging. That seems a little broad, so I can look deeper by clicking on the finding. And here I can see a list of all the actions that are allowed. It's a lot more than I intend, so I can go to the S3 console to fix this. Here I can look at the bucket policy, and I see that I've allowed put star for this VPC, when I really just want them to be able to do put object. So I'm going to scope this down. I'll save that. And as usual said, this is running constantly, so this will be updated in about 15 or 30 minutes. But since I've just changed it, I can click on Rescan to get an update right away. So now this finding has been resolved. And if I go back to the table, I see I have a new finding in its place. It says the VPC has write access, which is what I expect. Looking in detail, I see that they have put object access, just like I want. So I'm going to archive this finding as well. Now when I go back, I see I have no active findings for this resource. What that means is I can now be alerted whenever new sharing is enabled to this bucket. And I can take action on that, either mark it as appropriate or resolve the finding by changing the policy. And the archive findings are still available for auditing or reporting, as well as the resolve findings. So let's go back to the S3 console here and look at the integration for Access Analyzer. On the left-hand side, you see this Access Analyzer for S3. This will show you just your S3-related findings for Access Analyzer, and they're grouped by the bucket. 
So here I see I have a deep fried candy bar on a stick bucket, which is publicly accessible. That's not good, so I'm going to enable block public access. When I do that, it updates the block public access settings, it reruns access analyzer, and that finding goes away. And here as well, I can see my other buckets. So the cheese curd bucket has all the findings archived, while the bucket of cookies still has an active finding. So now I would continue and look at that finding, decide if it's intentional or not. So that's Access Analyzer. It's free. You should go turn it on today. Um, and now let's go back to the slides, and I'll show you how it works. OK. And I'm also going to tell you how we got here, because it's been kind of a long road for our group. And it's important uh, to, to where we ended up. So to start with, customers in AWS write down resource policies to determine who has access to the resources, to enable sharing. And they want to know, did I get it right? Does the policy do what I intend? And we wanted to help them solve this problem. So we first looked at the way they were solving the problem for themselves. Some customers were using manual review, where you just look at a policy and you think really hard about what it does and decide if that's what you intend or not. This actually works pretty well for one or two small policies, but it doesn't scale up. And it requires you to be an expert. You have to be at least as smart as the policy that you're analyzing. Uh, some customers use testing. So they deploy the policy into like a test environment and then make requests against it to see what's allowed and what's not. And this is really nice because you don't need to be an expert. You get to find out what actually happens when the rubber meets the road but you're not going to be able to cover all the cases. There's an infinite number of requests that could be made, and you're going to cover 10 or 100 of them. Some customers were using pattern matching or heuristics, tools based on these techniques that would look for things like, oops, things like uh, um, principal star or action star. These are pretty good because they cover broad categories, but they only encode the known patterns that are in the tool. And you're always going to have gaps in that. It has gaps by design. And then finally, some customers were using log analysis. So look at all the findings that have made, been made against a, sorry, all the requests that have been made against a bucket and see if each of those is what you intend. And this is actually a really good technique because you have lots and lots of examples. You have lots of data to work with. But the data you have is biased. It only shows you things that have already happened and it doesn't let you be proactive and figure out what might happen in the future. So we built a tool called Zelkova. And at a high level, this is how it works. Zelkova takes your policy, it takes a question you have about the policy, and it gives you a yes or no answer. Here, the policy can be uh, an identity policy, a role trust policy, an S3 bucket policy. And the question is a yes, no question. Like, can user Jane launch EC2 instances? Or can anyone outside of account 123 assume this role? Uh, can, or is my bucket accessible outside of VPC ABC? So you take your policy, you take your question, you give them to Zelkova, and it does what we call fancy math. And the reason for this is all those previous techniques are partial. They're limited. They only look at some of the cases. But we wanted to look at every possible case, the infinite possibilities. And for that, we need to use this kind of fancy mathematical techniques. So let's take a look at what those are. Let's take the question of, is my bucket accessible outside of my VPC for this policy? And first, let's just look at the case for one single request. So when your request comes into AWS, it has a lot of additional information associated with it. It says the principal who's making the request, what action they're requesting, it says what resource they're requesting, what time of day, the IP address, the VPC. And then the authorization engine in AWS tries to match the request against the policy. So for example, it'll say, does the principal match account 123? In this case, yes, it does, so we continue to the action. Does that match get object? Yes, it does, so we continue. Does it match resource? And it goes on and on through the entire policy to determine if you're allowed or denied access. Now, that's great for one request. But as I said, we want to do an infinite number of requests. And so we can't do them one by one. So we're going to use a special technique here. We're going to send just one request, but it's a special request. It's blank, empty. In a way, it represents all possible requests. And if we can see what happens for this one general request, then we know what happens for everything. It sounds great, right? So does this match principle one, two, three? 
This is where we get into a problem, because the answer is a little bit yes and a little bit no. For some of the requests, they do match, and for some, they don't. But there's only two cases. Either the request matches that principle, or it doesn't. So we can use another technique here, and we're going to split the world in half. And in half, we'll have all the requests that match principle one, two, three. And in the other half, we'll have all the requests that don't. And for the requests that don't, we know they're not going to be allowed. So I'll color those white here. And now we can continue to the action. Does it match git object? Well, again, a little yes and a little no. So we need to split the world in half again. And in half, we have the, the request that match principle one, two, three and action git object. In the other half, we have the request that match principle one, two, three, but not get object. And those ones won't be allowed. And this continues again. So for the resource, we split the world in half again. And then when we get to the, uh, the string not equals on the source VPC, we split the world in half again. And half of those requests will be denied. So when we're done, we've taken our one single generic request, and we've broken it up into all these bins that represent all the cases that could happen. And so to answer our question for every possible request, we just need to answer it for every bin of requests. So for example, look at these requests in white. These ones aren't allowed. So they don't make the bucket accessible outside of the VPC. And these requests up here, these ones are allowed, but they're all from VPC ABC. So they don't make the bucket accessible either. And so we can say with confidence that no, the bucket is not accessible outside of the VPC. And that's not from testing or looking at past behavior, but it's looking at all possibilities. If you want to know more, we have a post on the AWS security blog, and we also have a peer-reviewed research paper. The spoiler to this is that what I describe as splitting of worlds is really just building up big formulas. And at the end, we ask, does this formula have a solution? So that's Zelkova. That's the fancy math, the, the core engine that drives our policy analysis. But for today, we can just think of it as fancy math, as a black box that somehow gives you a yes or no answer to your questions about your policy. And that's great, as long as you know what questions to ask. And it turns out that's very hard. What are the right questions? Who should be asking those questions? Is your set of questions complete? Have you left anything out? Are you asking your questions in the right way? So this is the journey we've taken in our group, is we've iterated a lot on this idea of who asks these questions and what questions do they ask. One thing we've done is partner with large enterprise customers. So you may have seen their talks at reInvent last year or at summits and lofts throughout the year. And what they were able to do is take Zelkova and encode the governance rules of their organization as Zelkova checks or questions. And they could run these automatically, and it would allow their security team to scale. Armed with this knowledge, we tried to target more companies and customers. So we partnered with AWS Professional Services, and we created an engagement around Zelkova where we taught engineers and solution architects how to use automated reasoning, and they brought that knowledge to the customer. We also partnered internally with S3. So rather than coming up with the questions for each and every company, we came up with one question that everybody cared about. Is my bucket public? And we very carefully wrote down exactly how this question should be specified for Zelkova. And we made that available in the S3 console. And last year at reInvent, we partnered with S3 again to launch block, block public access, which when enabled, blocks you from attaching a public policy to your bucket. So that's just one question that everybody's uh, using. But customers want some more customization. So we partnered with AWS Config. And we offered basically templated Zelkova checks or questions. Fill in the blank. I don't want my bucket to be accessible except by these three accounts. And then config will run continuously and alert you whenever someone outside of those three accounts has access to your bucket. All right, we were feeling pretty good at this point. And we held a real private beta. We gave them user guides, API references, videos, blog posts. But we were deliberately hands off. We wanted to see, is this the right time? And what we found out was that Zelkova basically wasn't ready for customers. It was still too high touch. It was still too much configuration, finding the right questions, expressing them very carefully. And I have to be honest, this was a really frustrating place for us to be. Because we had something that we knew could be really valuable for customers, 
but we weren't able to connect on the delivery. I tell people it's like having this fairy tale curse where we knew all of the answers and none of the questions. Uh, but we didn't give up. In fact, we doubled down and we made a decision. We said when we deliver Zelkova to customers, it will be a one-click experience. No configuration, no asking the right questions, just one click and you get the answers you want. So with that, we went back to this original problem. With one click, is this the, the policy that the customer intends? And we found out we couldn't answer this because for some customers, this policy is exactly what they intend. And for others, it isn't. And with one click, we can't tell who's who. So we changed the question. Instead, we asked who has access to what? No judgments, no opinions, no good or bad, just the facts. And then we let customers decide whether or not they intend it. So with this, we actually had a model that could work. But we still had to answer the question. It's not enough for it to be possible to answer. And who has access to what is not a yes-no question. It's not something we can give to Zelkova. But let's just imagine for a moment that we can answer this question. What would the shape of the answer be? I don't know what it is, but what's the shape? What's the, the general structure? Well, the question is, who has access to what? So the answer is going to be, somebody has some access to something. And who's the somebody? I mean, there's a lot of somebodies in the world. Uh, but AWS really helps us here, because it's secure by default. Nobody has access to your resources unless you explicitly grant them access. And the way you do that is through the policy. So we can look in the policy to figure out who are the people of interest. For this policy, there's roughly three somebodies. There's principal one, two, three. There's principal star. And there's the VPC ABC. And there's two actions. There's get object and there's star. And one resource, my bucket. So now we know the shape of all the possible answers. We can figure out what all the answers might be. And we just need to figure out which ones are right answers and which ones are wrong answers. And this is where we can use Zelkova. We can take each of these and turn them into a yes, no question. So does one, two, three have star access to my bucket? Or does star have get object access to my bucket? Does star have star access to my bucket? Or does one, two, three with ABC have get object access to my bucket? And if you ask these to Zelkova for this policy, you'll find out that the first three is no, and the last one is yes. And that's what becomes your access analyzer finding. So this is the part that I think is really cool. I have the policy here on the left and the finding on the right. And I want you to look at the, the finding in the policy and try to figure out where in the policy did this finding come from. And what you see is that the finding didn't just come from any one place. We're not just taking the policy and regurgitating it back at you. We're actually synthesizing new information about how the statements in your policy work together to allow or deny access to your resources. So that's the key idea behind Access Analyzer. That's how we delivered Zelkova to customers. Rather than coming up with one perfect question that represents all your intentions, we dissect your policy into lots and lots of little questions. And we run these all through Zelkova. And that's what becomes your Access Analyzer findings. So this is the core loop of how we made this work. And the way I think of it, this process is a lot like my five-year-old. And the policy is a lot like coming home with a bag of groceries. She has a lot of questions. Are we having bread for dinner tonight? Are we having sandwiches? Are we having grilled cheese, French toast? Am I having French toast? Are you having French toast? Is mom having French toast? Is my sister having French toast? And she's not malicious, I don't think. <laughs> But she just wants to know, what are we having for dinner tonight? And that's what Access Analyzer does. It looks at the raw ingredients in your policy, and it figures out how they're going to work together and combine to determine who has access to your stuff. That's what makes it work. Now, if you've dealt with a five-year-old, you might be a little worried about the number of questions. Uh, but we're very efficient about how we ask these questions. And it's like playing the game 20 questions. You don't start with something really, really specific. You start with a really broad question, and then based on that answer, you narrow it down. So for us, the broad question we always ask at the beginning is, does star have star access? Does everybody have access to everything? Because if they do, then we're done. We don't need to say everybody has access, and also Madeline has access. That's redundant. 
And if the answer is no, then we can start asking just slightly more specific questions. So does 1, 2, 3 have star access? Or does ABC have star access? Or does everybody have Git object access? These are all just a little bit more specific than that first question. And if the answer is no here, we can start combining these. So does 1, 2, 3 with ABC have star access? Or does 1, 2, 3 have Git object? Does ABC have Git object? And only at the very end do we get to these really specific questions like does 1, 2, 3 with ABC have Git object access to my bucket? So let's look at an example. Suppose we ask this first question, does star have star access? And let's say the answer is no. Then we move on to these next three questions. So does 1, 2, 3 have star access? And suppose the answer is yes. Then we don't need to ask any of the questions below that. Those are all redundant findings. Instead, we can move on to the questions next to it. So does ABC have star access? Let's say no. And does star have Git object access? Let's say no. But what about the combination? Does ABC have Git object access? Let's say yes. So in this case, there are eight possible questions we could ask. We only had to ask five of them. And from that, we generated two findings. That's how we're able to produce findings very efficiently and also reduce the amount of noise and redundant findings that customers have to deal with. So I'm going to turn it over to Mark here in a second. But before I do, I want to go back to this question we started with. Is this policy what I intend? Because we didn't actually answer this for customers. We changed the question. But the nice thing is we've also changed the question for customers. Because now they just need to find out, is this finding what I intend? And it's a much easier question to answer. Because findings are simple, declarative statements about access control. It says, who has access to what? There's no negation. There's no denies. There's no if exists or for alls or for anys. Just who has access to what? And with that, I'll now turn it over to Mark from Millennium Management. Hi, thank you, Andrew. Thanks. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Mark Horda. I'm the uh, head of cloud engineering for Millennium Management. Uh, today, we want to talk to you about how we're leveraging all of the excellent work that is being produced by the uh, automated reasoning group when building our own internal services that leverage all of those APIs to get answers to questions that are specific to not only our industry, but our company, as well as our own AWS environment. More specifically, we want to talk to you about how we're leveraging AWS Alcova and AWS Access Analyzer, IAM Access Analyzer, in order to have more confidence into the roles, policies, and permissions that we're deploying into our hundreds of AWS accounts, as well as to achieve provable security in the process. First, let me, let me talk to you a little bit about Millennium Management. We're a hedge fund located in uh, New York City. As of August of this year, we had $39.2 billion in assets under management, with roughly 2,900 employees in offices, United States, Europe, and Asia. Our public cloud team has two primary responsibilities. We have the cloud enablement team that is responsible for managing uh, the interaction between uh, public cloud and all of our internal application teams, including traders and portfolio managers. And they help uh, not only onboard onto AWS, but also build cloud native applications. What we do in the engineering is we've built this ecosystem of AWS tooling and frameworks that sort of enables the other teams to onboard onto AWS a lot faster. We've, this is our third year into, the, uh, into our journey into uh, the AWS cloud, and quite frankly, has been fantastic. We, uh, we started uh, in AWS because we had a huge compute and big data problem, and we, ne we needed to solve that. This year, we've been doing a lot more of the uh, machine learning, uh, specifically with SageMaker. Everything that we build from the engineering team is, is very developer centric because we didn't want to have a lot of friction between public cloud and the internal development teams. They, we understand that you have your tools, you have your own way of doing things, but at the same time, you needed to, to use our framework to get onto the cloud because in our framework, we add or we bake all of the security controls for every resource that we deploy onto AWS. This way, it's not up to the development team. It's up to us to evaluate a service and determine what is the best security posture that we feel comfortable with when dealing uh, within AWS. We have hundreds of AWS accounts. Uh, we have about 200 internal application teams. 
and each team can have one or more uh, AWS account, depending on how they uh, configure their deployment uh, and uh, pr uh, promotion strategy. And the AWS account is basically uh, the first level of isolation. Within the, the AWS account, then they get put into different uh, organizational units, and that provides the second level of, of, um, of isolation. And we make available a lot of different core services that are now uh, peer with all of these other uh, AWS account, as well as core services that are managed and owned by the public cloud team as well. So for example, when we want to create a new account, we go through our account provisioning service. And, and basically, the account provisioning service creates a new account and sets up all the guardrails, all of the security controls to operate safely in, uh, in AWS. We have our own internal security framework that uh, is constantly monitoring all of our accounts for things that are deviating for our base rules. If it sees a resource is deviating from the base configuration that we have defined, it would either try to remediate it, or in some cases, if it cannot, it will just uh, remove it or shut it down. But the key here is that it's a detective control. We, we're using this after the fact. So it takes a lot, of, as Andy explained, it takes a lot of work for us to see something new and then react to it and then add uh, applications and programs that, that can fix them and, and resolve those problems. So this year, one of the things that we wanted to do was to uh, move, uh, be more proactive. So we went out and we removed all of the capabilities from all of our accounts to have IAM access capabilities. So no one in the organization can actually create an IAM role. Uh, we did that because we just wanted to have a central service that can control all of the IAM access across all of our hundreds of accounts. And so we built a service. We built a, server, a service called Icarus, and we actually showcased this service in um, the uh, New York Summit in the past July, so there's a link there, you can see it. But the interesting thing about Icarus is that it's powered 100% by Selkova. And what we wanted to do is before we deploy a role into any account, we wanted to ask a set of questions. Is this role more permissive or more restrictive than our base control policy? If the answer is more restrictive, then we will go ahead and provision that role into, your, into those accounts. If the answer is no, it's more permissive because they're actually, they added an API that we haven't blessed yet, then that request will be denied and we'll send you back a good set of information as to how to resolve that problem. Right? But Icarus and Selkova couldn't answer all of the questions that we had. So our primary concern as well was like, what other accounts and what other resources in other accounts have access to our resources? We couldn't answer that question. Selkova can do that under the hood, but there was a lot of work for us to do. But fortunately, they just released IAM Access Analyzer. So thank you guys for doing that, because that saved us a lot of work, right? And we deployed another system called the Cross Account Permission Validator, which is powered 100% by IAM Access Analyzer. And that's what we're going to talk to you in a, in a few minutes, how we accomplish that. The, uh, the reason for building all of these services internally of course, you know, we get all of the uh, security controls and AWS best practices, but more importantly, it put us on the road to achieving provable security. And the road to achieve provable security for us started with the traditional methods, right? Just basically uh, the service control policies, all of the rules engines that are our own proprietary algorithms to, to prove security. But we started to leverage a lot of the work that is coming out of the ARG group. Guard Duty, Inspector, AWS Config, Tiras, Selkova, and now I am Access Analyzer. And that actually got us to something that we call internally as actionable, provable security, because we're being very, very proactive as to what we're deploying now into our hundreds of AWS accounts. And we can answer these questions by asking Selkova and I am Analyzer, is this, so is this what I intended to do? If the answer is yes, then we'll go ahead and do that. Now what I want to do is I want to bring Aaron, and he's going to talk to you about CAT-V and uh, walk you through our architecture and how it was implemented. Thank you, Mark. Uh, my name is Aaron Fagan, Principal Cloud Security Engineer at Millennium Management, and I'm going to take you through the service that we built on top of IAM Access Analyzer to manage cross-account permissions across our organization. 
Uh, my goal here is that I will explain this well enough so that if you find value in it, that you could deploy it in your environments. Uh, so I, I love this quote. Uh, give me six hours to chop down a tree, and I'll spend the first four sharpening the ax. We spend our time building solutions to automate our intended security posture. These solutions are our acts, and the services we build are force multipliers for our security practice. During the beta, we saw the IM Access Analyzer as a fantastic tool to simplify the difficult work of identifying resources shared across accounts. It's not easy stuff. Uh, and then we layered our own business logic on top of it to make it actionable, to achieve that actionable, provable security that, that Mark just mentioned. So let's take a closer look at how we leveraged IM Access Analyzer to manage cross-account permissions. So we, we really needed to wrap our arms around the various IM and resource-based policies granting cross-account access across hundreds of accounts in an automated fashion. Uh, CAPI monitors IM Access Analyzer findings across all the accounts in our organization and responds accordingly based on the business rules. So is an IM role allowed to be assumed by a core service, um, like the one Mark mentioned, our account provisioning service? Maybe we'll ignore that finding. Is there some question about the validity of a bucket policy? Maybe we send an alert. Is a bucket open to the public? We definitely need to remediate that. Uh, we, we don't want to do that. Uh, so first, I want to just talk about the overall workflow of the solution. And then we're going to deep dive into each layer uh, so you understand how each one of those works. Uh, so the first thing we need to do is uh, prepare accounts to onboard into the service. And we do that by creating an analyzer to start generating findings. Uh, the next thing we do is, is trigger a lambda on a schedule to execute the cap v step function, which we're going to dig into. Now, I know what you may be thinking is, is triggering this on a schedule, that's suboptimal. And that was sort of the constraints of the beta. Uh, I'm also going to go into some of the new features that were released as part of uh, the IM Access Analyzer release at reInvent uh, and how they will uh, change our future state architecture. So you can see the optimizations that uh, the automated reasoning group has made available to us to improve this architecture. So bear with me and we'll, we'll get to that too. Uh, so that Lambda function is going to enumerate the accounts that we're interested in. It's gonna add some extra metadata and send that over to the, the step function, which is then going to reach into those target accounts, list the findings, and then evaluate those and make some risk assessments based on uh, the data that's in there. So let's take the, uh, a look at the first step, which is preparing that target account to onboard into the service. The, the function that we use to do this is that account provisioning service that, that Mark had mentioned in a centralized services account. You, you can do this in a variety of different ways. This is the way that we've chosen to, uh, to do it here. And so we make a, uh, an API call into that uh, target account and create the analyzer. So let's look at the code that we actually use to do this. Uh, that account provisioning service is uh, step functions. And inside of there is a Lambda function uh, that's Python-based using the Boto3 SDK. And so here we're creating a Boto3 session. We're doing some cross-account role assumption logic so that we have permissions to uh, call APIs for that target account. Then we create an access analyzer client and call the create analyzer API to create the, the analyzer in that target account. We give it a name, and then we give it a type of account. And so what that means is uh, the findings that are generated will list resources that are shared outside of that account boundary. All right, so we've prepared our target account. Uh, let's look at what uh, is actually done in the, the workflow um, when this executes. So we have a time-based CloudWatch event, uh, as I said, that, that's scheduled. Uh, which executes the Lambda cap v launcher function. That retrieves the accounts that we're interested in along with some metadata and sends it over to the cap v step function. Cap v is then going to reach into the target account and list those findings. It's then just uh, gonna internalize them, uh, analyze them, 
and respond accordingly, whether that be uh, an email or maybe an automated permissions remediation task. Okay, but the, the heart of this service is really the cap v step function, right? So you're wondering what goes on in there. Uh, so I'm, I'm gonna tell you. And so we start with this lambda function to analyze the findings. And it does this against the rules engine that we created. Now, as Andrew mentioned, the, the business logic of what's permitted and, and what's not permitted is really unique to each business, right? So you're gonna have to decide those things on your own, uh, but the workflow is the same, or it could be the same. And so in looking at those findings, we assign a risk level, and then we have a choice step in the step function, which is gonna determine what action we take uh, based on that finding. So if it's something relatively innocuous, you know, maybe it's permitted. And there's not much interesting that's going on here. We, we skip right to the end. There's more on that later in the, the future state architecture. If it's a higher risk level, uh, maybe we send an alert. And we can do that using the SNS direct integration with step functions. If it's an even higher risk level and we want to auto-remediate, uh, we then uh, call the, the remediate lambda function, which is going to roll back those sensitive permissions. And then we proceed on to a lambda function which is going to verify that that remediation occurred, right? Because it's, it's not enough to just perform the remediation, go on your merry way, think that you're, you're good to go. Uh, we actually want to verify that. And then the result of that verification goes into the step function event, and we have another choice. If we were successful in the remediation, uh, we send one or more emails. And you might think, why are you sending emails if you've already confirmed that the remediation occurred? There's a number of reasons why we do that. One is, as part of cloud security, we certainly want to know if someone has created resources that, uh, with permissions that uh, are so permissive that we had to auto-remediate them. Right? So we want to know that. We also want to notify the, the, our customers uh, that they're deploying code that's not safe. And this gets to what Mark talked about uh, of the shift left philosophy and the feedback we're trying to get to our customers so that they can iterate and they can improve on their own. So it's important to give them that feedback. And furthermore, we've made changes to their resources. So the resources are gonna be different from the code that they deployed. We cer certainly wanna make them aware uh, that we did that. If we were not successful in remediating uh, those permissions, and then we definitely want to know that too, uh, so we can go in, take manual action, and then also look at our own code uh, to figure out why we weren't able to, to auto-remediate that so we improve in the future. All right, so let's look at some more code uh, that we would use to list those findings in those accounts. Uh, so you could actually reproduce this using the API. Again, we're using the Boto3 SDK, uh, we're creating an access analyzer client, and we need to uh, get the ARN of that analyzer. Now, I have cheated a little bit here, so I'm using the list analyzers API, uh, but as part of the beta, you could only have a single analyzer, so you might notice I, I, I cheated a little bit. But you can imagine um, listing out the analyzers and iterating through those if you had more than one. There's just only so much room on the page. All right, so after we retrieve that analyzer ARN, uh, we then go ahead and do a list findings API call. Uh, we, we filter on the, uh, the analyzer ARN, and we add a filter uh, statement uh, to filter only on active findings, okay? Because the service that we built is for remediating active findings, and so we want to filter that. We wanted to give you an example of how to do that here. All right, so uh, as I mentioned, there's a ton of new features that are launched as part of the, the official IM Access Analyzer launch, and uh, we really wanted to bring to you what we think the future state will be and uh, tell you why we think these new features are so valuable. And so I'll walk through that now. So let's take a look at the, the high-level future state architecture. Uh, we start with a new analyzer finding. Uh, IAM Access Analyzer now has direct integration with CloudWatch events, so we can trigger based on each finding. 
right? So this is much, much more efficient than reaching into account, an account on a schedule, listing all the findings, and then processing all of them. We can now doing, do it at the finding level uh, using those CloudWatch events. Um, we then send that to a CloudWatch event bus in the centralized services account, uh, which uses a CloudWatch events-based rule to trigger the cap fee step function execution. And again, keep in mind, this is for a, for a single finding we can do this. Uh, so cap fee runs, and it's going to uh, you know, perform the action that's necessary, an email, or automated permissions remediation. And then there's some new functionality we can use, the rescan and the archive findings, uh, APIs, uh, to further refine this workflow. And I'm going to get into that uh, in just a minute. And so you can see this is a much more efficient uh, architecture. All right, so let's look at how preparing the target account will change as, as uh, part of using these new features. Just as before, we're using the account provisioning service uh, to create an analyzer in that target account, but we have two new resources that we're going to create as well that CloudWatch event rule, and then the CloudWatch role that gives us the permissions to put those events into the centralized services bus. All right, and the step function also changes too. Really, what these, uh, these new features and these new APIs allow us to do is reduce our code base, right? Because we're, we're constantly trying to write less code so that we can uh, maintain less code and uh, write new features for, for this service and other services. So the, that analyze finding API, or uh, Lambda function, is reduced dramatically because we don't have to process this list of findings. Now we're, we're processing a single finding. And we run that through our rules engine. We assign it a risk level. And now, if we have one of those situations where we have a, a, a permitted cross-account access, we can use that archive API to acknowledge that it's something that we intended and we don't have to repeatedly process it. So in the, in the previous architecture, we would list out those findings and, and recall that we were just ignoring those. Um, and then they would show up every time uh, we did a list findings and uh, we would repeatedly process them. So this is much more efficient and so we're, we're uh, happy to have that. Again, we can still alert at a, at a higher risk level in the case where uh, we want to remediate a finding, remember we had the, the remediate lambda function and then we had a, a lambda function that would verify that the remediation was successful. Turns out that's a lot of code. <laughs> and as new resources uh, get onboarded or would have gotten onboarded into uh, IM Access Analyzer, that's more code that we would have to write to look at those policies and then remediate those. With this rescan API, we don't have to do any of that. The, the automated reasoning group has done that for us. And so all we have to do is remediate those findings, do a rescan on the findings, and see if we've uh, successfully remediated that. So it's a, a big advantage. Again, we put that into the choice and uh, we respond accordingly. So, uh, you know, we've walked through uh, how we created this cap fee service on top of IM Access Analyzer to, to really help us manage these cross-account permissions. The, the functionality that uh, the Automated Reasoning Group has given us as, as part of um, these new APIs has been uh, really valuable. Um, and uh, I said at the beginning, you know, I hoped that uh, at the end of this that you would understand this well enough so that you could deploy it into your environments. I hope I was successful in doing that. Um, I thank you, and I'll turn it back over to Ushwal. Thank you, Aaron. Uh, yeah, so to summarize, we, uh, we, we launched on Monday, and this is available for free. Uh, and to just get back to what it does, it, it essentially analyzes continuously, keeps monitoring your policies, keeps giving you new findings or updating your findings as you change your policies and as resources either get shared or are you are you remediating your findings um, yeah and then the workflow is pretty simple as andrew mentioned we worked really hard to make sure it's single click one click um, yeah so if you find value uh, do please take the survey and we'll stick around for a few questions uh, given that we have five more minutes thank you <laughs>